so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. The following episode contains the retelling of traumatic events. Listener discretion is advised. It's 4pm on the 9th of February 1988. A 22-year-old woman named Helen McCourt with long, dark brown hair, picks up the phone. She's about to leave work at the Royal Insurance Office in Liverpool, having negotiated with her boss to leave an hour early. Helen is ringing her mother, Marie. She tells her that tonight she'll be going out with her new boyfriend, but asks that her mother have tea ready when she arrives home so she'll have enough time to wash her hair. Marie agrees... Sitting with her daughter Helen and discussing her work or her relationships or her friendships are among one of her favourite things to do. Once Helen puts down the receiver, she walks out into the wintry afternoon. It's raining with fierce gusts of wind, as is often the case in northern England. In just a few hours, the temperature will be near freezing. Helen estimates it will take her about an hour and 15 minutes to arrive home, which she shares with her mother and younger brother in Standish Avenue. But 5.30pm comes and goes. Helen's tea goes cold. Her mother looks out the window at the foul weather, making the streets unbearable. Where is Helen? And how close has she come that evening to opening the front door? I'm Jessie Stevens, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. In today's episode, I'm speaking with Marie McCourt, whose daughter Helen disappeared on her way home from work in 1988, never to be seen again. The man charged with her murder, to this day, has never revealed her body's whereabouts. I wanted to begin by asking what kind of person your daughter Helen was. I've read a lot and read that she was incredibly friendly and bubbly. I'm cheeky. (laughs) (laughs) I'm cheeky and she was always very quick at picking things up, you know, as a child growing. And she just loved children and every friend she had from growing up still keep in touch with me after all these years. Why do you think she had so many friends? What attracted people to Helen? Because she was a very caring person. And, you know, sometimes girls, especially in school, they can sort of be a bit nasty with another girl. And Helen would always leave her group and go over to the person who was on their own. And she'd persuade them to come in with me. And and those people have said to me, Helen was the nicest girl in school. She just mixed very well. You know, her first job when she left school was in what we call the dole, where people haven't got jobs and they go to collect some money to keep them going. And all the people in there couldn't believe that Helen came in to her office with a smile. And at the end of the day, she would go out still smiling. (laughs) She had a lovely way of getting them on side, you know, while she looked into their problem. When she was 22, she was working. Was she still living at home? Yes. Oh, yes. She was a real home bird. What was she doing? What did her life look like? Because she'd recently started seeing someone and she was working. What did her life look like at that time? She always had a group of friends, a mixture of girls and boys, you know, in the village. And one of them, he was very attracted to her and they started courting. And this would only have been when she was about 20. And he was besotted with her. And they were talking about going to live in Canada 
because he had relatives there. And I knew that she wouldn't settle. And I said to her, Helen, you went to the hospital down in London. You love the job, you love the people, but she missed her home. And then her boyfriend finished because he wanted to go living in Canada. And she just got on them with her friends. When she came back from London, she eventually got a job in Liverpool with the Royal Insurance. And she worked on ordering computer stuff and things like that. So she got to be quite knowledgeable on that. It was only just coming out. We didn't even have mobile phones then. And on the day, she rang me three times within an hour to say, I'm going out with Frank. This was an Italian boy who lived in the next village. And she said, Frank's coming to take me out tonight. He's picking me up at eight o'clock. And will you have my tea ready for between a quarter past five and 5.30? Because her other friend who was getting married wanted to pop in and tell her where she was up to with all her wedding things. And she rang three times. And on the third time, I said, Helen, I know I haven't got a good memory, but this is the third call within an hour. And uh, I said, I won't forget, your tea will be ready. And of course, we had these 90 mile an hour gales starting to come up over Liverpool. And she wasn't here for a quarter past half past five. If she missed her train, she would ring me immediately to say, oh, mum, you know, I'm going to be a little bit late. And so I just got on with everything. I had a tea ready. And then I heard that the trains had been delayed because a tree had blown over onto the line. And then when it got to about seven o'clock, we were trying to get through to British Rail to find out where was blocked. And eventually we did get through and they assured me it wouldn't have affected Helen's train. It was after her stop. And that's when the panic set in for me. And we rang her colleagues from work. I rang her friends in the village. And we got nowhere. So we then decided we would go in to Liverpool, even though the weather, you know, the police were warning you, do not go out unless it's urgent. And I tried to trace her steps from where she worked, the railway. And then I found out that her train was running on time, only three, four minutes late. And so I just said, can you tell me where the nearest police station is? I need to go and report her missing. By this time, it was coming up to about uh, half past nine, quarter to ten in the evening. The sergeant who was taking the details, he said, go home. She's probably at home now. And I said, no, we've rung from the telephone box outside of the station. And my son's at home and she's not home yet. And so, well, when I go home, I said, can I ring you? And he said, oh, yes, of course you can. And I said, how often can I ring you? And he said, very offhand, he went, oh, well, uh, you can ring me every hour if you want. And that's what I did. I got home for midnight. I rang at midnight, one o'clock, two, three, four. And then at 20 past four in the morning, I'm still sitting, Luke and waiting, thinking she's been in a hospital and they're bringing her home. And it was two officers and they searched her bedroom, they looked around the garden and then they asked, could they take the picture of Helen that was on the coffee table? And they set off. And I just knew something was terribly, terribly wrong. And, uh, and uh, it, it was just horrible. But the police, within a matter of 48 hours, less than 48 hours, they were doing a search of houses because they knew she got off the bus in the village and she only had to walk 500 yards to get to her home. I mean, we didn't have these cameras that you have, you know, on the streets now. You didn't have mobile phones. You had to go to a call box. And so they decided that they were searching every home that Helen had to pass. And they did that on the Thursday morning. And on the Thursday lunchtime, they took the manager of the pub, Ian Sims, and his barman, and also his young girlfriend to the uh, police station to question them further. And, of course, they had his girlfriend, the barman, and him all in separate rooms in the police station. And the barman and his girlfriend, re recollection of the Tuesday evening, 
was similar, very, very similar. Ian Sims, this was totally different. And that is when the police knew he just lied. And after the trial, the police officer in charge said, had you not have been so insistent that night over your daughter's welfare, he would still be running his pub because he was already starting to get rid of the evidence. And in terms of the evidence, it's notoriously difficult to get a conviction when there isn't a body. There was so much evidence against Ian to connect him to this crime. What were some examples of the things that police knew they had that would get a guilty conviction? How was everyone so sure that Ian was the person who had done this? How they put that together was amazing. And the evidence was DNA then. It was just coming out. And all of that accumulated. A a man heard her scream. Well, he heard a scream. And he caught the bus 10 minutes after Helen. And he lives in the village. And he heard this high-pitched scream. And now I knew that Helen would not have gone into that pub because she wanted to have a meal and everything else. But anyway, the police believe that he hit her. He's tried to get her to go into the pub and he's struck her and that has been her scream heard. So when the police started to search, because the forensic chap came down to have a look at his car because of all this mud, and they found Helen's earring in the boot of the car, uh, which had described her jewellery, what she was wearing. And then they found blood, there were head hairs. His jacket was found three weeks later up in the area where his clothing was found. And then at three miles further on, Helen's clothing in bin bags and his jacket was hanging from a tree. And there were bullets in one pocket because he went shooting. And Helen had bright green Canadian woolen myths from her previous boyfriend and of course there were threads of the woolen mitts in his pockets his jacket pockets along with head hairs because of Helen's hair it was so long and they needed to know exactly and they kept saying what shampoo did she use what like this and I would tell them and then they kept saying there's something missing Was there anything else? And then it suddenly came to me and I said, about once, three, four weeks, she would put Dettel in the last rinse of her hair. And that was the one thing that they were looking for to say, this is Helen McCourt's hair. And her hair was up the stairs because it was very long and he'd struck her at the side entrance. That's where a lot of blood was because he hit her so many times. And that's where you get the airborne blood. And she was dragged up the stairs, and we know that from the fibres of her coat, her head hairs, because if someone's pulling a dead weight, she must have been unconscious. Because uh, Helen would fight, she would have forced. But, you know, he was a big, heavy man, and he was in full muscle building and everything. And she was only eight, just over eight stone, you know five foot four, she wouldn't have had a chance. And then more evidence was found upstairs in the private quarters of the pub in the back bedroom. And in the back bedroom, you know, you have the little butterfly clip on the back of your earrings. Well, they found that butterfly clip in the back bedroom, a small bedroom where he kept all his spirits and that. So everything like that all matched up. There was so much evidence against him. And for him to say he's innocent is just absolutely ridiculous, you know. That's what I was going to ask is when you're in a courtroom, there is this much evidence. It couldn't be any more damning. Did you go to the courtroom? Have you ever had to look at this man who is responsible for your daughter's murder? Yes. uh, I didn't know the man. So the first time I saw him, was in the court and I was the first witness to be called because obviously I'd run ground and so, you know, I had to be questioned by his barrister and uh, I had to identify 
where they found Helen's clothing and her coat, and, and her lovely coat was wrapped under the arms and full of mud, and, uh, and it was really hard. But I was like a full day in the witness box, and I sat through the whole thing, and I, everything is in my mind, you know. I'm sorry for getting a bit upset now because it's so it's so real. It's like it was only yesterday that all this happened. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Jessie Stevens. I'm speaking with Marie McCourt, whose daughter was murdered on her way home from work in 1988. Her body has never been found. When he was coming higher up in how many years he'd served in prison, that's when I thought then, I've got to do something. We need a law for this, you know. They can't just be released from prison without saying where their victim's remains could be recovered from. So that's when I started in 2015, putting it together as a petition. And it only actually went on the statute book in January of this year. Because every little thing always seems to block us. It would be going ahead and then something could happen and Parliament would stop, you know. And then I would have to pick it all up again and start from scratch. But we got there. And it's really reached around the world, this Helen's Law and what you're calling for. Can you explain what Helen's Law means and why it matters so much to the families of victims? The reason why I felt we needed this law, because we were in the EU, you know, we had the course of human rights, and I knew that we couldn't keep them in prison, but with Helen's Law, I wanted it that unless they show remorse, they cannot come out of prison, you know? And so I was assured by two home secretaries over the years with that, but apparently joining the EU, you don't have anything like that. You're in the course of human rights. And these killers, these evil, evil people who won't even relinquish where their victims' remains can be recovered for the family of their loved one, because I was told that he would never be released until he showed remorse. And obviously, that changed when we went into the European Court of Human Rights. And so then I decided we've got to have this, and this law must be that until they show remorse and say what they did to their victim, and only then could they be looked at to be safe to be released back into society. And you actually wrote him a letter that outlined why this was so important to you and that all you want is to be able to bury your daughter. It is the least you could possibly ask for. What did you write in that letter and and what did he respond? Basically, I was urged by some of the press, why don't you write to him? You know, he may tell you. And uh, so I wrote a letter and I thought, because this man is a bit of a psychopath, you know, don't do it as an angry letter, Mary, you know. So I, I wrote it out and I, I put it. It's three years, three long years since I last saw my beautiful daughter. So three years since I heard her laughter. Three long years since we've missed her. And then I went on and I said, all as I want is for you to tell me where we can find her remains and you will never hear anything from me again. You know, I will leave you to get on with your sentence and be released when the government believe he's safe. And the letter I got back off him was horrible. He'd done us as a mirror image. He started off with my beautiful children, because he had two young children aged about five and seven at the time. And uh, 
he put in my beautiful children. I've not seen them for three long years. And it went on and it wasn't too bad while he was right. And he was saying, I'm innocent and, and I can't tell you where your daughter is. And then all of a sudden, it was like he was getting ready to sign off and send the letter. And it's like as if something called him suddenly in his brain, he's lost it. And what he wrote was horrible. It was a very threatening letter. He threatened my son. Uh, he threatened me with religion. God forgive you, he said, because I won't when I get out. And I believe in an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth and a life for a life. And when I get out, I will have justice. It was horrible, really horrible. And all the work that you did with Helen's Law, which is going to affect a lot of families and benefit a lot of families who are in deep, deep grief, that didn't come through until after Ian had been released from prison. Do you remember that day and how that felt to know that this man was now free? Well, it, it, it almost cost me having to break down. You know, I've kept going over all these years, 33 years, and I knew it was going to happen. I took it to a judicial review, and obviously because of this virus, we should have had this in the February before he was released. It ended up, it was in July, and so I, I just couldn't believe it because they released him about four days before Helen's murder on the calendar. He was released on February 5th and Helen's murder took place on February the 9th. And I was totally devastated. I got a phone call from the probation officer who dealt with me all these years. And she rang and she said, I'm just ringing to let you know he's been released today. And I couldn't believe it. And I ended up with about four television camera crews at my house. And it was put out on the news. And I still didn't know on the reasons why. But it turned out that the parole judge said there is absolutely no doubt that Ian Sims murdered Helen McCourt. However, he is invested in himself that he's going to come out of prison as an innocent man. And we believe that uh, he would rather die in prison than tell me where my daughter's remains could be recovered from. And therefore, we believe he would never tell Mrs. McCourt where her daughter's remains are. And therefore, we believe there is no point in keeping him in prison any longer and therefore we feel he is safe to be released. And I only found that out on the afternoon, late afternoon, with one of the journalists from the newspapers who was sat there and she came and she said, what did you think about them? And I said, well, I haven't heard anything else. And she read it to me. That was how I was informed of why their decision was to be released. I'm fighting over how parole hearings now are dealt with and how the victims' families are treated. And basically, I just want them to understand what happens to families like us when there is nobody but there has been found a guilty. And I believe it is starting to change now that they are putting the innocent victims or, or families of the innocent victims first before a killer like that is released. And that was the last thing I wanted to ask you is you have worked so tirelessly and for any daughter could not wish for more in a mother than what you have done over the last 33 years. And is it difficult at this stage, so many years later, to still maintain hope? Do you have hope that one day you will be able to bury your daughter? Yes. I do still have that. It's like stretching a, a piece of elastic, you know, until it breaks. Well, I haven't broke yet. And once this lockdown is and we're allowed out, I've already got about three places that we want to go and search in. 
and one is a very important one, you know, which that comes first. And yes, that's what my husband and I will be doing. And my son will come sometimes, but he's got two children now. And so I just want his life to be able to go forward. And finding Callum will help that an awful lot. So as a mother, no, I will never, ever give up. After the death of her daughter, Marie McCourt campaigned tirelessly to introduce Helen's Law in the UK. Helen's Law is legislation that sees parole judges take into account an offender's refusal to disclose information about their crimes. The law entered the statute book at the beginning of this year and has since inspired similar campaigns that are currently underway in Scotland, Ireland and Canada. You can find a link to Marie's book, Justice for Helen, in our show notes. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Jessie Stevens. Sound design is by Ian Camilleri and our producer is Gia Moylan. If you'd like to find out more about the show, don't forget to join our online community. Just search for True Crime Conversations on Facebook and make a request to join.